Thank you very much. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, when I took and I accepted the kind invitation to be here today for this really exciting event, I looked at the, uh, the list, speaker list and I saw that I was the warm-up act for Tony Juniper. Uh, he's not quite here yet, so you've got me for a little longer than maybe you'd hoped. Uh, and, uh, and I was also rather hoping that he would, you know, he would take the stage and you'd forget what I said. So you're now going to focus more on me, which is, we'll see what happens. Anyway, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much. Um, and I thought today you will have all seen the, uh, the release of the IPCC report, the latest intergovernmental panel on climate change report. Chapter three, so what I did, okay, and don't tell my team, but what I did was I looked through to see whether they'd cited any of our work and they didn't. And I was absolutely furious. And I thought, why exactly? You know, we're producing some world-class re research. Why aren't they citing it? Then I looked up the word vegetable in chapter three, which covers food systems. How many times do you think the word vegetable in an IPCC report is mentioned? Once. Once and only once. The focus is still and remains still on cereals. There's a huge focus globally on the impact of environmental change on cereal production, all the major cereals on the planet, but we cannot live by bread alone. When are people going to realize this? The importance, the critical nature of vegetables in our diet, vegetable and fruit. So I'm rather pleased that I called this, type, this talk Vegetables and Health Now and in the Future. And I'll be talking a little bit about today's health, but also a little bit about some challenges for the future. So my first slide, the, second, you know, the next slide is really, uh, you, you won't be surprised to see this slide. This is the, the Eat Well Guide, Public Health England's recommendations for what we in the UK should be eating. But I could have put up the recommendations from any government that has produced uh, uh, food recommendations, dietary recommendations, uh, because they are all much the same. Large amounts of fruit and vegetables in the diets, large amounts of complex carbohydrates, and increasingly small amounts of uh, animal source foods, and of course, uh, uh, you know, trying to cut out sugar and fat. And the recommendation here is that in the region of 40% of the diet should be from fr for fruits and vegetables. And that's because fruits and vegetables provide those critical nutrients, minerals, vitamins, and also fiber. Uh, few. I, I am now the warm-up act. Uh, fr uh, fruits and fi uh, uh, vegetable uh, fiber that's so critical for, for human health. And the Eat Well Guide actually uh, the, uh, a portion, uh, recommends five portions of fruit and vegetable a day, a portion is about 80 grams. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you do the calculations, uh, the Eat Well Guide recommends seven portions of fruits and vegetables a day. So a really major uh, intake of fruit and vegetable is recommended. Now, why is it recommended? It provides these nutrients, it provides uh, all these essential things for our diets, but why is it recommended? Well, these are the data from the Global Burden of Disease for 2016. And this is mortality in the UK uh, uh, caused by risk factors from the diet. And at the top there, we have uh, low, uh, low intake of whole grains, and then we have low intake of fruit, and then we have low intake of vegetables, and then uh, a series of other things that are important in the UK diet. If you add uh, the, the, the amounts of deaths attributable to low vegetables and the amounts of deaths attributable to low legumes in the UK, it comes to more than 20,000 deaths in the UK alone are attributable to a low consumption of fruits and vegetables. Excuse me, of, of fruits and legumes. So a major, major cause of ill health in this country. And if you, that's, uh, those are deaths largely on that slide from cardiovascular disease, but we know that, uh, that uh, increasing intakes of, of, of fruits and vegetables associated with reductions in coronary heart disease, strokes, some forms of cancer, and of course, uh, uh, about a 10% reduction in all-cause mortality. So really important part of our diet. Now, we're supposed to eat five portions of fruit and vegetable a day. Who in this room eats five portions of fruit and vegetable a day? Uh, see? <laughs> Speaking to the converted largely, but what's the reality in the UK? The reality in the UK is this. The reality is that teenagers, that really hard group to tackle, around three portions a day. Older, so older adults, somewhere in the region of four portions a day. Who meets the recommendations of eating five a day? 8% of teenagers and 30% of adults. 
So really, there's a huge issue uh, about, you know, we have a recommendation. It's based on the fact that increasing intake of fruits and vegetables is good for health and would reduce mortality. And the reality of consumption is completely different. People are not eating the fruits and vegetables that we'd like them to. And when they do eat fruits and vegetables, what are, what are the sources? Well, sadly, a major source of fruit and vegetable in the UK for young people are baked beans and the tomatoes on top of pizzas. So, of course, whilst there's nothing wrong with baked beans and the tomatoes on top of pizzas, these foods also come, highly processed foods also come with other things which are potentially less good for health. So is there a problem with vegetables? Is there, aren't there enough vegetables on the planet? What's going on? If you look at the data from the Food and Agriculture Organization, and I recognize, given how small these lines are, you're going to struggle to see that. Sorry for that. But the availability of vegetables on the planet over the, from 19, uh, 1980 to 2010. Um, so I'll show you, there's a line there that you might be able to see a dotted line going up, which I've labeled vegetable oils. So there's a huge amount increase in the availability of vegetable oils on the planet. Large increases. Vegetable oils are often, you know, from seeds, uh, uh, used in, in, in processed foods. There's lots of them. Along the bottom there, low, much, low but also very constant availability of those important things, pulses, fruits, and vegetables. So there's been no real increase or no real efforts to increase the availability of these foods. And, of course, availability is associated with, uh, with, with access to those foods, prices of those foods, and therefore consumption. So what has the UK done in terms of consumption? What are, you, what are people in the UK eating? In 1987, these, uh, these groups of foods, uh, these, this small list of foods here, which reads uh, tomatoes, cabbages, carrots, uh, not even I can read that, uh, peas, onions, cauliflowers, lettuces, and mushrooms, provided 90% of all the vegetables consumed in the UK. By 2000, we'd had an, an, an increase, and by 2016, a greater increase. So we're seeing an increased diversity in the vegetables that are being consumed in the UK. That's really good news. Increased diversity, increased access, increased, increased access to a, a greater diversity of foods is likely to, be, uh, likely to have benefits. But have we thought where those foods are coming from? Are we producing them in the UK, or are we bringing them in from outside? In 1987, 80% of vegetables, roughly 80% of vegetables were produced in the UK. 80% of the vegetables that we consume in the UK were produced in the UK. 80% of, uh, of, many of, the fruits, of many of the vegetables that we eat regularly in the UK were produced here. And you can see that when we did import it, we imported these foods largely from Europe. And for those of you with very keen eyes, Saudi Arabia. And that's only tomatoes, just so you know. By 2016, of course, this had rapidly changed. And you can see that now roughly only 50 to 60% of foods, of vegetables that we consume in the UK are produced in the UK. And there has been a rapid decline in the proportion of those commonly consumed foods that we produce here. And you'll also see from this graph that some of the foods, many of the foods we're now consuming in the UK are being imported from countries that are vulnerable to climate change. And on a day like today, when we're talking about the impacts of one and a half, two degrees changes in, 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 in climate over the next uh, 10, 15, 20 years, we are now asking poor countries, typically poor countries, which are extremely vulnerable to climate change, to produce those foods so that we can eat them here in the UK. How tenable is that? How long can that carry on? And what are the consequences if we do, in fact, not meet the one and a half, but go to two or even greater degrees, greater temperature? So we asked that question in, in, in our group at the London School. And we asked the question, what's the impact of environmental change on yields of vegetables? And we looked at five major environmental changes, increased carbon dioxide, increased water or decreased water availability, increased temperature, increased ozone, and increased salinity. And these are the modeled effects of the, the changes in those five variables on the yields of vegetables on the planet. We brought together all of the evidence that had ever been published in experimental studies, and we conducted a meta-analysis to bring all of the data together. And it shows us very clearly 
uh, uh, I'll come back to carbon dioxide, but it shows us very clearly that, ca that increased carbon dioxide levels increased yields, and we know that because plants like carbon dioxide and they therefore increase their yields. But in, uh, increased temperature, uh, decreased uh, water availability, increased ozone and increased salinity all have significant impacts on yields and will lead to declining yields globally. So we're facing a world where in the, in the future, all of those things are likely to happen together. And that's also the important thing about carbon dioxide. There's a lot of discussion about the advantage of carbon dioxide for increasing yields, but our analysis showed that car increasing carbon dioxide with any other changes in the environment, so increasing carbon dioxide with reduced water, or increased carbon dioxide with increased ozone, would lead to either no change or declines in yield. So that carbon dioxide effect is therefore likely to be nullified. So we are, we're in a crisis moment here. We recognize that vegetables are a critical part of the diet for healthy diets in the UK. We recognize that the UK vegetable consumption is well below target, and we urgently need to think of ways to increase vegetable consumption. There is increasing diversity of vegetables being consumed in the UK, and this is a really good thing. Increases access, increases types of foods, uh, reduces reliance on particular types of vegetables. But we're also now getting those foods from increasingly vulnerable countries. And that is going to be more and more of a problem for those countries and for supply chains here wishing to, ins to ensure adequate supplies of vegetables in the UK. And finally, environmental changes in the future. And this is not in the way distant future. This is in the near future. Environmental changes in the future are going to increasingly challenge the ability of the food system to deliver uh, healthy and nutritious diets for all. Thank you very much.